morning. You guys all look really good this morning. Well, we're so excited. I'm so excited to be going through revival. And Aaron started last week. He started two weeks ago in Psalm 85, verse 6, which I notice is written right up here. You know, sometimes it's hard to memorize scripture, isn't it? But when it's right up in front of you, when you start losing focus on what I'm saying, just take a moment. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, there we go. If you lose focus on me and uh, I'm dragging on, just take a few minutes to look here and let's, let's make this a, a goal that this scripture, Psalm 85, 6, would be something that we'd be pondering and thinking through. And this is such a great scripture, isn't it? Will you not revive us again? that your people may rejoice in you. And I've been thinking, I love words. Um, Words, do you know that words are always changing? Things that had deep meaning 50 years ago are struggling just a little bit. The meanings have totally changed. And so I just was thinking about this. And as we're looking at at revival this morning, we're going to be looking in John chapter 1. But I just want to kind of quicken in us again this idea of revival. And the idea, uh, I mean, we say words and we sometimes have no idea what they really mean. I know sometimes I say the craziest words and people come to me later and say, Dean, do you know what that word means? And I say, well, of course I do. But then I go back in my Google and I ask Google, what does this word really mean? And the word revive, the, the root of that word is vive, which is a great word, isn't it? Vive. Have you ever seen someone with a shirt saying vive? And the word vive is a French word, and it means life, which is so wonderful, isn't it? We all want life. Do you remember when you were alive? And, you know, so often we get into schedules and into routines and we lose the life that we just had. We, we get busy and we're thinking about some event coming up in the future. We're thinking about some event that's happened in the past. And we're thinking, I just want to survive today. Maybe survival is a little bit too high of a standard. I just, I just want, don't want to get run over today. Um, It was exciting this morning. I was crossing the street and I almost got run over coming into the church. I thought, wouldn't that be interesting? What would happen if uh, the speaker had been run over on the way into church? And, you know, so often we're thinking about where we're going or where we've been. We we stop thinking about, well, what, what gives us joy? And I was thinking about times in my life times in my existence where I've had life. When was a time when you were really alive? And I I was thinking about some events that have gone on. I remember holding my first child. My goodness, what an experience. I remember the day I got married. I remember... The day I got born again, and the hope that there was there, and my life had meaning and purpose, I had joy, I was happy, and so this word revival, the beginning of it is vive, the root is, let's have life, and then re means do it again, right? Okay, well, revive us, Lord. We want to come back to the life that we had. We want to come back to a moment when we experienced something so powerful that it felt like time kind of stopped. And we thought, this is why I'm here. You know, I remember 
I was working as a chaplain at Lakeside and they had a strike and I had just started as a chaplain there. There was 2,500 workers there and 1,200 people were striking and 1,200 people weren't striking. And so the 1,200 people that weren't striking, there was a picket line, so we were gathering in this farmer's field, which in September, it was, it was pretty cold at 6 o'clock in the morning in a farmer's field. And I remember the first day we were standing there and uh, we stood there for six or seven hours and they said, well, we can't get through the picket line today. I said, okay, so... I came back the next morning at 6 o'clock in the morning and we were standing around and uh, at about 10 o'clock in the morning, we'd been there four hours and all of a sudden the buses started up. There's like seven or eight buses, school buses there and they said, they said, slaughter team on the buses and so I ran and I got on the first bus and the, the general manager of the whole place which it was great that the general manager of 2,500 people knew me. He looked at me and he said, Dean, can you kill a cow? I said, well, I, maybe, I don't know. I haven't tried yet. He said, no, you can't. Get off the bus, Dean. Get off the bus. I was so upset. I thought, you know, this is why I'm here. I'm here as a chaplain to walk with people through life's difficult situations. And uh, so I got off the bus and... And one of the guys that I knew that was driving the bus, he said, Chaplain, why aren't you on the bus with us? Don't you believe in us? I said, well, he kicked me off the bus. He said, get on my bus. I got a seat for you. So I got, I was on the first bus. There's like seven buses. And we were this convoy of yellow school buses in Brooks, Alberta. And we were going down all these back, back alleys and stuff so that the, the picketers couldn't get in front of us. And and we were going down this side road about 65 miles an hour. And all of a sudden, there's a CBC News van. And he was going one way. We were going the other. And he jammed the brakes on. I remember he went in reverse. We were on this main road. And he was trying to keep up with us in reverse. And we went into this farmer's field. And we were going through it about 30 miles an hour. Farmer's fields are a pretty rough place to uh, be driving in a school bus, especially in the back. I was in the front, so I was okay. But I remember I was the first one off the bus there. And I went and I stood at the door. And, you know, everyone was afraid. Everyone, no one had ever been through this experience before. And I was there at the door and I shook everyone's hand as they went in. And I, I had this feeling, God, this is what I was born for. Lord, this is what you've created me for that I could be with people in turmoil and I could be encouraging and helping them. And that's one of the most alive I've ever felt. And you know, think about a moment like that for you when you were really alive. Say, God, do it again. Do it again, Lord. Bring back that life. We are meant to have life like that. And then he says, would you revive us again? Well, just a minute. God says, I gave you the life the first time, and then I revived the life, and now you're saying, revive me, revive me again? And you think, well, you know, I, I, I gave you life to start off with, and then I re-sparked that life up, and now you're asking me again? But the reality is, we need to be revived over and over and over again. Our human nature gets us caught into procedures of life that are life-destroying. Routines that take away from us that purpose and the meaning that we have. What God created us to be. And mostly God created us to be in relationship and friendship with him, didn't he? And we find that we lose that over and over again. And so, revive us again. And, and the last thought before we get into our sermon is, what's the word between revive and again? What's that word there between revive and again? Us. You know, so often we pray, Lord, revive me. But look around the church Take a look at some people that are in church with you this morning. Revival isn't an independent activity. 
it isn't personal revival. It's community revival. You know what? If someone is lagging behind, if they don't have life in them, and you're having a revival, we're missing something. And it's not something that we want to condemn people and say, you know, if you just had more life, my life would be better. But we come alongside someone and we say, how are you doing? How is, how is your life? Are you living life? Because God wants to revive us. He wants to bring back that joy of life as a community, not as individuals. So we're in John chapter 1. We're looking at... We're looking at revival, and we're going to start in verse 35. And so John the Baptist had seen Jesus the day before and said, Behold, the Lamb, the Lamb of God. Yeah, that's right. And so... It says, the next day John was standing again with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned, and he saw them following, and he said to them, what are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said, come and see. What a great statement, right? Come and see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the 10th hour. And one of the two that had heard John speaking and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John, but you're going to be called Cephas, which means Peter or rock. And the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip, and he said, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said, can any good thing come from Drumheller? Oh, no, sorry. Can any good thing come from Nazareth? And Philip said to him, what did Philip say? Come and see. see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said, How do you know me? And Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you're the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answered and said, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So we want to spend a few minutes. we're, We're trying to, I'm trying to stir myself in revival. And hopefully we'll all kind of jump on board and we'll all say, okay, I'm, I'm on this journey with you, Dean. I'm on this journey with you, Aaron. I'm on this journey of seeking to have my life restarted. And even if it's been restarted and I fall into a place where it's fallen apart, I'm going to do it again. And, and so I want to talk to you about four main issues in this. One is, who gets revived? The second is questions of revival. The third is who gets revived? Questions of revival. What is the third question, isn't it? Oh, there we go. And what are the practices that we see in this that bring us back to life? And so the first question is who gets revived? And we're going to... um, I encourage you to look at Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10, and into John, where uh, Mary is going to see Jesus. Due to time, we won't take all the time to read those in uh, John 20, 12 through 15. But 
The question is, who gets revived? And sometimes we think about revival, and we think, if revival comes, people that don't know Jesus are going to find life. But that's not what revival is. Revival is people that have already met Jesus, and their passion for God has grown cold. Their life is picked up daily routines that are actually life-limiting. And they end up becoming three decades, four decades, five decades of being a Christian. And they say, I remember when I first became a Christian. Have you ever heard anyone that said that? I remember the great days of long ago when God used to move. Let me tell you. And instead of saying, I'm believing I'm going to find the life of God today. I'm believing that although things were great, I was born again in May of 1980, which is 43 years ago almost. I know you're looking at me, you're thinking, Dean, that must have been, uh, you can't be 46 even. You look like you're only like in the, your mid-20s. You're thinking, how in the world was that 43 years ago? But, you know, it's so easy for me to look back and think, and there was this great event that happened, but so quickly in my life, I ended up getting into a routine. And the excitement and the amazement that the God of the universe who made the sun and the moon and the stars, the God who makes all of the insects that we see and we don't see, the God who's created our bodies to overcome diseases that are unbelievable, that same God chose to be my friend. And not only that, but he died on the cross so that he could be connected to me. I mean, really, I should be excited about that every moment, shouldn't I? But I end up sometimes saying, oh, yeah, the routine things of salvation. I knew that 43 years ago. And when I start saying that, I go, Dean, watch out. Watch out. When the routine things of salvation don't stir my heart with excitement anymore, I'm in need of revival. Because the life that I've had is pausing. So who gets revival? There's... There's two different people we see in this very scripture that get revival. One is the disciples of John the Baptist. And I would be afraid to meet John the Baptist. Think about who John the Baptist was. Jesus himself, he said, what did you come out in the wilderness to see? Did you come out to see someone dressed in fine clothes? with pleasant speech and refined eating manners? Well, John was out living by a river, sleeping under the stars. He was wearing camel hair, and he had a leather belt. I, I'd like to think it would have been one of those 12-inch leather belts. You know when those were in? Some of, some of you older people might remember those... I mean, now we got these skinny belts. Are they really even belts? You want to you have a belt so wide that your, your cowboy belt buckle looks small on it. And uh, so there he is. He's out there. I mean, John, if you're following John, how are you going to dress? If you come dressed up and you're standing in your best Sunday clothes, and John's wearing this old, smelly, dirty camel hair and this really obscenely thick leather belt. You're, you're going to kind of dress up like John, aren't you? If you're going to spend time with him, you can't be with him and not become like him. What are you going to be eating? Well, you know, really, I really like, Lord, to have... Uh, hamburger. Lord, I'd really, I'm, I'm going gluten-free, and I'm dairy-free, Lord, and, uh, you know, if you could kind of, I'm putting in my, my diet restrictions. Well, he ate 
locusts, which is grasshoppers. I've seen a video of someone that ate a live grasshopper, and the last thing that went down were the legs that were moving in his mouth. Can you imagine? You're, you're out there in the desert, and you're saying, well, this John the Baptist, he's so passionate about God, but I see these grasshopper legs going down his mouth, and he's eating honey. Oh, Lord, I need a more balanced diet than that. Where are the greens? I would really like uh, some sort of smoothie to go with that. Well, if you're hanging with John the Baptist, how are you eating? You're, you're eating what he's eating. And then what was John the Baptist saying? All these religious leaders were coming, and he said, you den of vipers and scorpions. Well, if John's saying that, you'd have a hard time saying, you know what, you guys, you're okay. It's all right. You know, try better tomorrow. I'm sure tomorrow things will come up better. So here are these disciples that, I mean, they are on the far edge. Uh, I remember watching this movie called Crazy for God. And maybe John and his disciples were a little bit in that corner. And, you know, you think, well, does, do they need revival? Think, well, these guys, they've got all the outward showing of people that are crazy for God. They, they, I hope to be like them someday, but you know what? They were with John the Baptist, and John the Baptist said, here is someone who I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. And so these disciples of John the Baptist, they were following Jesus, and Jesus said, well, what are you looking for? And they said, where are you living, Jesus? And he said, come see. Come see. And then think about Nathaniel. He was living in this settled city. And, you know, people used to pray under fig trees. I was reading about the Garden of Gethsemane in Jerusalem. And they didn't have mass transit. They didn't have uh, high occupancy commuter lanes. I mean, everybody was just smashed together in this town, and there was no room for green space, and there was open sewage, and there was lepers that were hanging around everywhere. And so people that had money, what they did is they would buy a garden outside of town. And they would go to the garden, and they would go and they would sit underneath a fig tree, and they would sit there and they would be remembering their, their memorized scripture. And under the fig tree, they'd be talking to God. So what does that tell us about Nathaniel? He had some sort of means that he was able to have a fig tree to go pray under. He had a routine of prayer. He had a routine of Bible reading. And... The fig tree, I was reading about the fig tree, and the fig tree is a picture. Remember, Jesus cursed the fig tree, but a fig tree that is blooming is a figure of the Messiah. So a lot of people feel Nathaniel had this forward looking. He was doing this daily routine, but he was looking forward to the Messiah. And so you think, well, that guy, he's got his daily, his daily time with God together. He's got his finances together. He's not wearing camel garments with that big leather belt. This guy's got it all together. I want to be a Christian like him. And Philip came to him and said, well, we found the Messiah. And Nathaniel said, can any good thing come from there? And, and he said, Philip said, what did Philip say? Come and see come and see. And so, wherever you are, whether you're a radical John the Baptist type disciple, or whether you're a every day reading your Bible and living a, a good Christian life and looking forward to something, and anywhere in between, you are a candidate for revival today. If you have a love for God in your heart, God says, I want to give you 
more life. I want you to be revived. And so, how do we start revival? And, and you know, the, the first thing that I like so much is there's questions. I was reading this week, Jesus asked over 300 questions in the Gospels. Well, God, why are you asking so many questions? Why does God ask questions? I mean, he knows everything. Yes, so that we rely on him. And another thing questions do is they reveal our heart. And so I I like also that Jesus, he initiates with John the Baptist's disciples The first question, I mean, Jesus is walking along and these two disciples are walking behind him. In some areas of Canada, it would be called stalking. (laughs) I remember I worked at a swimming pool and uh, this one lady, she was working in the the gym and we, we had this RCMP officer come talk to us about dangers in in uh, relating to people and crimes and he was talking about stalking and and so someone said well Charlotte you have people that are stalking you and she said well it'd just be light stalking so I had this image of light stalking versus heavy dark stockings but John the Baptist disciples they were stalking Jesus they were walking behind him and and so he turns around and he says what are you looking for What a great question, isn't it? Have you ever heard Jesus ask you that question? What are you looking for? What are you looking for? And because God started with the question, they felt comfortable to ask a question and say, well, where are you staying? Where are you staying? I was thinking this morning about Ezekiel 37. Verses 1 through 10. And it says, uh, Ezekiel said, God got me up and he took me into this great big valley and he had me walk through the valley. And in the valley, there were all these dry bones. And God said to Ezekiel, and I I love this question. I've I've been saying this question all morning. God said, can these bones live? That's quite a question, isn't it? You know, I I run through the graveyard from time to time here in Drumheller. Wouldn't it be something if God stopped me as I was running through the graveyard and said, Dean, can these bones come up from underneath the ground and live? I said, well, Lord, I I don't know. That's such a strange question. And, And Ezekiel, I love his response. He says, oh, God, I don't know. God, only you know if these bones can live again. But that question, it sparked something, didn't it? It sparked something in Ezekiel. The question that Jesus asked the disciples, it sparked them. And it, I'm not going to take the time, but if, when, if you have time to read in Matthew 28, 1 through 10, and in John 20, 12 through 15, we see Mary and the other Mary. I don't know, if you had to have a name, would you like to be Mary or would you like to be the other Mary? Apparently, one quarter of all women in Israel at that time were called Mary. There were probably a lot of conversations like that. Well, this is my sister Mary and this is my other sister Mary. For those of you who might remember that TV show from a long time ago. I'm Daryl, and this is my brother Larry, and my other brother Larry, the other way around. But, you know, all of them, there were questions. And, you know, I I was, um, five years ago, I was was living in Winnipeg, and I'd made 40 trips back to Lethbridge in six years because I had kids that lived in Lethbridge. I was doing the math, and I figured it out. I was coming back once every three months almost a 2,500-mile round trip. 
And that was before grandkids. I said, Lord, this is not sustainable. And so my wife and I were saying, God, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to move back to Alberta? Do you want us to stay here in Winnipeg? Or do you want us to go to Sudan? We had this passion to go to Sudan to work in a in a refugee camp. And then there was this chance in Dee's Lake, a missions trip in Dee's Lake. And my wife said, I think I've heard from God and we're not going to Dee's Lake. But, uh, but I was fasting. I fasted for seven days. And I remember I was, I was at the prison. I was working at a federal jail and I was going between minimum and medium security. And I was walking and I said, you know, Lord, I've been fasting a long time. Like seven days without food makes one week, Lord. Come on. I said, I just really want to know, God, do I, do I go to, back to Alberta? Do I, do I stay here in Winnipeg? Do we go overseas as a missionary? And then I'm just quiet and walking. Walking is such a good thing to do because eventually your brain kind of turns off. And I, I felt like I had this question asked to me. It could have been God. It might not have been God, but I, I felt it was a good God-type question. And the thought was, Dean, do you want me to tell you where to go, or do you want me to come with you? And I said, really, Lord, I just want to know where to go. But I said, okay, I get it. I get it, God. That question stirred up within me. Am, am I just trying to go from destination to destination, or do I want God to be traveling with me? Questions are so powerful. Questions are so powerful. And I encourage you to examine what kind of questions in conversations around you, as you're sitting and listening to conversations around you, listen to the questions that people are answering because questions reveal a lot about a person's heart. It's not the answer so much as the question. Questions so often reveal what's happening in the human heart. And then start to take it a step deeper and say, what questions am I asking when I'm just by myself and I'm really reflecting on life and where life is going? What questions am I asking myself? And then even a step deeper is, what questions is God asking me? And those are three pretty deep areas of study. But I encourage you, we can learn so much through questions. And so we see all these questions that are going on. And then Jesus said to the two disciples, one was... Peter's brother, Andrew, and the other disciple, he said, come and see. And I just want to take about 10 minutes to talk about, about these two incredible thoughts. And, you know, it's... Those, those are two incredibly difficult things. Come denotes movement, right? It, it means Get up from where you're at and get to a different perspective. You know, when we get somewhere different, we see things different, right? I remember this one guy telling me he wanted to paint his car red on one side and yellow on the other. He said, that way if I'm in an accident, someone on one side will say it was a red car in the accident. Someone on the other side would say it's a yellow car in the accident. And that way the case would be thrown out of court and I'd be fine. Our perspective changes what we see. And so Jesus said to John the Baptist's disciples, he said, come, move, move. If you're not moving, you're dying. Did you know that? If you're not moving, you're dying. And that, that's indicative of everything in life. Some of you might remember Dick Van Dyke and he was in his mid-90s, and he was still, he was an actor, and he, he was double-jointed. He could do incredible things with his body. He could, he could be down flat on the floor and jump up in such a way that 
when I was 35, I couldn't jump up like he was at 95. And some, someone asked him, and they said, Dick, what's the secret that you've found to having life? And he said, keep moving. Keep moving. And you know what? So often there is a danger in our Christian life that we stop moving. That we say, you know what? I have found all the truth. I've found, and many people wouldn't say that, but many people would say, I've found all the truth I want to find. That's quite a statement, isn't it? And you know, it's, it's interesting because when Jesus' disciples first met him, they could have said, well, I've seen everything of Jesus. He's not going to change. Jesus is the same. So I'm going to stay at home. But what did his disciples do? They moved with him. They moved with him. And I'm convinced if we want to be close to God, we can't be relying on yesterday, last year, last decade. But we need to say, God, you're on the move. God, you're on the move. And if you're moving, I've got to move with you. I've got to move with you. And you know, movement is really hard. And I'm finding that as I get older. You come look at my lazy boy chair in my living room. It's well dented. My little, my little dog jumps up on my lap. He's like maybe eight pounds. But man, he is powerful. Once he jumps up on my lap, that's it for the night. I'm done. I'm not moving. Because I don't want to disturb my little baby Max. And especially if I get up, then he jumps on Lorenda's lap. And then I'm by myself all night. So... You know, once I get in my chair, I'm not moving. And you know what? I'm getting older. And you know what? I, I've accomplished so much in my life. I have done so much. And I deserve, really, I deserve just to sit back and relax. And, you know, let the young people do it. Let the young people do it. Let them go hard after God, and I'm just going to sit back and watch what they do. And you know, I'm tempted to do that all the time. All the time I'm tempted to just reflect back on, on great events that have happened in my life with God. And what God, how God has met with me. And just think, you know what, I'm good, I'm good. But then all of a sudden, I get this, this little feeling in here that, you know what? God is alive, and God is moving, and I want to hold on to the God that's moving. And if I'm holding on to the God that's moving, I'm moving, right? If I'm holding on to the God who's moving, then I better be moving because my arms aren't long enough. And, you know, it's so hard. What I'm, what I'm asking you to do, what Jesus is asking you to do, come. It goes against everything in our nature. I was having a talk with someone recently about diabetes. And the fact is, um, we know if you don't want to have diabetes, or if you do have diabetes, and you want to keep most of your body attached to the central core and not start losing little bits here and there, that there are some basic things you got to do. You've got to exercise. You've got to drink water. Don't eat sugar. Watch your blood sugar level. There are things, and a lot of it just comes back to diet. Just eat a certain way, and you can control your diabetes. But I was talking to this lady, and she said, Dean, I've seen person after person that I've talked to about changing their diet so that diabetes doesn't kill them, and they won't do it. They won't do it. Why won't people change their diet so they can live the reality is, I've been with people in the hospital with diabetes. They start cutting toes off. 
And then they've got open sores and they cut their feet off. And then I was with someone that was getting an amputation of their leg and he said, you know, there's two different amputations on your leg. There's the AN above the knee and there's the BN, BK, below the knee. And he said, you know, when I was in school, I was always striving for the A, but in this case, I'll be really happy with the B, <laughs> the below. But you know what? I've, I've seen people lose everything with diabetes, and still they're eating unbelievably bad. I had an inmate I was working with in prison, and he'd have one of those little styrofoam cups of coffee, and he put seven teaspoons of sugar in it. And I looked at him, and he had diabetes. I looked at him, I said, what are you doing? I said, that's going to kill you. And he said, no, Dean, vegetables will kill me. <laughs> Sugar is good for me. And you know what? He got out of jail, and within a month, they found him dead with Cheetos scattered over his chest because he wouldn't change his diet. And when he was in jail, they were maintaining his, his diabetic and his blood sugar. But when he got out... He just did whatever he wanted. And the fact is, why don't we as Christians move? Why don't we as Christians humble ourselves and say, God, okay, I'm going to do something different to seek you. I'm going to try something different. I'm going to look for you in a different way. Lord Jesus, I want to see you. I want to, you know what? Even when God was a rock, he moved, didn't he? In Corinthians, it talks about the rock that rolled, the first rock and roll ever was Jesus. I say to Lorenda all the time, yeah, we need to listen to rock and roll. Jesus was the rock that rolled in the desert. She doesn't buy that. But uh, even when Jesus was a rock, he moved. And the last thing I want to talk about is see. Jesus said, move. Move and see. And in Isaiah chapter 6, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, it says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be something? You'd be willing to sit in church 15 minutes longer if I could promise you. You stay till 1115 and God will show up. Most of us, I mean, some of us have to probably get our supper ready and stuff like that, but most of us would stick around for another 15 minutes. And Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And the smoke filled the temple, and the whole temple was rocking. Here we go again with that whole idea of rocking. Yeah, there we go. And, and he said, woe is me. I'm undone because I've seen God. And the, the angel comes and touches his lips with burning coal. Do not try this at home, please. Children, don't try it at home. But it worked for Isaiah, apparently. And then God said, who's going to go with my message? And Isaiah said, I'll go. And Isaiah said, what is the message that you want me to tell the people? And, you know, it's such a great question. What's the message? Isaiah chapter 6, 9 and 10. Here's the message. They'll always be looking, but they'll never see. They'll always be listening, but they'll never hear. They'll always be seeking to feel something, but they will never feel it. That's a really bad message. I would think... God, you're going to give me a message. It's going to be this encouraging kind of message that I'm going to have. And, you know, the fact is, Jesus said, come and see. Philip said, come and see. And this whole idea, we have to come and see. We have to look. And when we see, when we see something, it changes us, doesn't it? I've written down, five occasions in the New Testament where this is quoted. Four times in the gospel, all four gospels have this saying from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. You're going to be looking, but you won't see. 
You're going to be listening, but you won't hear. You're going to be seeking to feel something, but your heart will be hard. Tell you what, Jesus warned us. And the key is, the key is we have to be looking for Jesus. And it's so interesting. I wrote down some scriptures. I'm almost done. Thank you for your patience. I wrote down some scriptures about Jacob seeing God, about Samson's parents seeing God, about, uh, but in Exodus 33, God says, when you come to see me on the mountain, I'm going to cover you with my hand as I go by. Because any man who sees my face will die. And you know what? Well, I'm saying to you, what, what's part of revival? Come and see. Come and see God. And then you're saying, well, Dean, that makes no sense because you're telling me to come and die. Come and die. Well, yes, I am. Because hopefully when you see God, your flesh will die. The, the natural responses that block us from God will die. And we will see God. I encourage you, as a homework project, to take a look at John chapter 11. John chapter 11. I think I wrote it up there. There we go. I didn't put the actual verses. You have to work a little bit harder at it. But you know what? Jesus went to see Lazarus. And he was weeping. And Jesus had a question. He said, where did you lay Lazarus? What did the people say to Jesus? Come and see. Come and see. And you know what? When Jesus shows up and sees us, there's resurrection. So we're just going to pause for a second. I'm going to ask the worship team if they could come up right now for... We're going to sing a song, and I just want you to take a moment and think, what, what was it out of that scripture that really impacted you about, about revival, seeking life again, about you needing revival, about the fact that there's some questions that are going on, you want to be more ready to ask and hear questions, or... God is asking you to move, or God is saying, open your eyes and see me. And so as we sing this song for a few minutes, I just want you to just reflect. Think about those questions. <laughs>